I'm Ari Gronich, and this is Create a New Tomorrow Podcast. Welcome back to another episode of Create a New Tomorrow. I'm your host, Ari Kronich, and I have with me Nick Reed. And Nick is a conscious capitalism kind of guy. Uh, he's an author, speaker, entrepreneur, and activist. Presently, he works at the Americans for Prosperity Foundation as a speaker and content creator. Previously, Nick holds degrees in psychology, philosophy, has worked in radio, politics, education, business, and nonprofit. So Nick, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you became Nick? <laughs> well, how I became Nick is, oh, where do I begin? But the short version is I was growing up following the same path that everybody else did. You know, you go to school to make the grades, make the grades to get into college, get into college to get a degree, get a degree to get a job, get a job to make the money to then buy the time to do the things that make life worth living, right? Well, in my story, I'm looking around at the adult community at say age 14, 15. And these are people who followed the traditional path much farther than I have. And they don't look like they're in any kind of place that I'm trying to get to. You know, they're still looking for that thing that, that I'm looking for. And so I'm wondering, well, is this a path for me? So me and some other really stupid friends kind of had this quarter life crisis. And we decided we are like Peter Pan, never going to grow up. We're just going to try and base jump and skydive and suck all the fun out of life that we possibly can recklessly probably die before we turn 18 and have any real responsibilities. You can see how much we appreciated our parents, you know? Yeah. And um, <clears throat> so we lived like this, but we didn't, die, or at least I didn't die. And, uh, but I did have an epiphany and I was out surfing a hurricane. I think it was Katrina in Galveston. And I realized, and I don't know if it was like the near death experience type inside or just a, just an epiphany, but I said, this is a moment where I feel fully alive, where I feel truly free. And I can honestly say there's nowhere else in the world I would rather be than exactly where I am in this moment. There's nothing else I'd rather be doing than exactly what I'm doing right now. Well, I can't live in a hammock eating mangoes every single day, surfing every day if I want these moments to come more often than all the other ones. What is it, seriously, about surfing that, that I can't get from the rest of my life and education and a career and a family and a job and all the other things. What is it that I can't get? And so that question wasn't like a question you find in school. This was like a quest. And so I had to go on this quest for maybe a decade to figure out how to get that thing that makes life not just worth living for, but worth living fully for. And what I realized is I realized that it's not just me who's having a coming of age crisis, that in, a, in, in many ways, our society and our entire world is having a coming of age crisis. You know, we also are running from our responsibility and, you know, using our freedom really in irresponsible ways. And, uh, you know, there's, there's all the problems that you know, people complain about all the time that I don't have to list here, but when people look out the window, see the world laying in ruins and past the point of no return, and they say, yep, never, never land for me, buddy. <laughs> yeah. So I realized that, um, that there was a real opportunity there, uh, uh, an opportunity to play an active role, to try and create the conditions that makes life more conducive to the kind of experiences that we think makes life worth living fully for and to inspire others to, to do the same. And so that's led me kind of to, to where I am today. Nice. Yeah. You know, I, I got to the opportunity to see uh, Peter Pan at the Pantages theater in Los Angeles with Sandy Duncan and that song, I won't grow up. I won't grow up. You know, it just always has stuck in my head. I won't grow up. If growing up means it would be beneath my dignity to climb a tree, I won't grow up, right? And that's kind of the idea that, that uh, people tend to 
you know, I, I hear this, this word a lot, adulting. You know, this is a new word in the dictionary. It was just being a human being of age. Before that, right. <laughs> I'm adulting. And, uh, <laughs> and it seems like, <clears throat> you know, the more we adult, the, the less fun we have and the more serious life is and the more problems we get. Did you find that to be uh, fairly accurate? Somehow we've come to Alan Watts. He's a, a philosopher that was popular in the sixties and had a radio show, I believe in California. He talks about how we have learned to do things that we don't enjoy doing. And then we teach our children to grow up, to do things that they don't enjoy doing to teach their children. And it's all wretched to no vomit. We never get there. And I think that today we have this, and people blame the educational system or the media or who, who knows, but without any blaming, we do have this idea that life is drudgery that you have to, to get through and, and not this, as he would say, musical thing that you were supposed to sing or dance as the music was being played. You know, it's this real serious pilgrimage. We have to get to that thing at the end, the success at the end of the road or, or, or heaven at the end of life or whatever it is, you know, and we're all focused on that. And we're just flying by at the speed of light, not even looking out the window. And if we did, it would just be a blur anyway, because we're moving so fast. Yeah. So what is, you know, to me, like I look at the world, it's changed a bit. We're, we're starting to develop this nomadic society because we're all in the digital age. We don't have to go to the building for the job. So, so people are starting this process of becoming more nomadic, which is kind of like going backwards in time to a place where, you know, the gypsies would travel freely around and uh, we would explore the world, right? Um, how do you think that not exploring the world has damaged kind of a country's ideals, our country, other countries, but damaged the, the ideals and the, the nature of how we act in our society? Well, that's a really interesting question. I don't know. I would say that we're going to have to find out. You know, people are locking themselves in their dungeon uh, for fear of, of going out. And, you know, maybe there's some real risks. But, um, I mean, I had corona and, and made it through. And it was rough. It was a pretty rough flu. And there's some, my grandmother's got it. And she's in the hospital with pneumonia. And, you know, it's, it's a serious threat to people. But at the same time, there's risk every time you walk out your door. There's equal risk by getting in a car and driving on a freeway. And, you know, we're, if you really calculate the risk and compare it to things that we do on a daily basis, um, there's some significant trade-offs to not living your life and, and staying in the dungeon. You know, I mean, we're, we're, we're growing up with our kids, you know, not being allowed to do things that we were allowed to do. They, you know, kids don't climb trees anymore. Kids don't even go outside unsupervised for fear of the parents having CPS called on them. Uh, we're, we're coddling our youth and coddling of the American mind is a great book by Greg Lukanoff and Jonathan Hyatt, who I had a great conversation with about this uh, not too long ago. You know, I don't really know how this is going to affect us, but I do know that people are getting unsocialized and people are, and it's really easy to dehumanize and objectify people and therefore treat people more like objects than humans, the more distanced you get from them. Right. And especially you can, you know, I mean, like, let's say people on the other side of the world, let's say you've never been to China or you've never been to Peru or Iceland, right? And you're talking about those Icelanders, okay? And their culture. And all you know about them is what you've read in a, you know, Encyclopedia Britannica or something. It's all an abstract like your, your knowledge and relationship to those people is not direct. It's not firsthand. It's all abstract. And it's way easier uh, for that relationship to degrade into something that's not good, the more distanced you get. And so here we are, and we're all isolated and, and quarantining and locking down and travels, you know, being restricted. Uh, and there's something about 
being able to be introduced to different ideas, different perspectives, different uh, viewpoints that enriches and adds to our own that I think is super valuable, especially today. If you look at where we're at, um, there are people who are more so divided politically that they can't have a conversation with their family at Thanksgiving. People aren't get, even getting together for Thanksgiving, first of all. But if they did, they wouldn't be able to get along. And people dread it because their uncle is going to go off about the president and that's going to start a conversation with their sister. And before you know it, everybody's looking down at their dinner plate, trying to avoid it or up in a fight, depending on their, their temperament, right? And, and people can't talk to each other, much less get along, much less work together to make a difference. And we need each other's perspectives in order to, to grow, uh, in order to arrive more nearly to the truth, and in order to get anything done, you know? And so it's, it's really going to, it could possibly damage our ability to even have a democracy if people don't get that exposure to a diversity of ideas anymore. And we really just sit on Facebook with our echo chambers. Right. You know, one of the things I love about the, uh, the Israeli government, and this may be controversial to some, but it, this is a piece of, of the government that I like is there's 18 parties all with an equal say. And uh, if you know any Jewish person, then you know that uh, for every one Jewish person, there's 10 opinions because we're always exploring the options, the possibilities, the thoughts. We're having discussions about what is possible, what's not possible, what's real, what's not real, what the interpretations are of things. It's, it's an interesting um, culture in general. And, uh, and so there's a diversity in conversation, even between two people. You could have two people having a conversation that goes into 20 tangents, right? So the question that I have, and, and it's a question I've had for a while, is how do we remember how to listen? And listen not with the response that we're about to give, but listen with the intention of learning maybe the truth, maybe not the truth, but at least the perspective of the person and where they're coming from. I think we really need to do a thought experiment and that a thought experiment is what would life really be like if everybody thought and walked and talked and believed just like us it's in order to actually be interested and curious about other people and their point of view and, and their ideas you have to be able to think about what it would be like to lose that. Okay. Now, so you can imagine, let's say you're in a dream. Everybody's had this kind of dream, a lucid dream where you wake up and you realize you're dreaming. Well, let's say you have a lucid dream. Okay. And you, you wake up, you go, Oh my gosh, I'm dreaming. And you look around and you realize I'm dreaming all of this. Everybody in this dream is actually a character in my dream. Wow. So, so then play with it. Okay. So um, let's imagine, and I'm not sure this really happens, but let's imagine nothing can happen that you don't dream is going to happen, right? No surprises. You are the, the creator in your dream world. All right. Mm -hmm. And you make everything up. Now let's play that out. Okay. Everybody who is going to say something, you already know what they're going to say. Everybody who thinks something, right, they can't think anything different than you because you're the dreamer of them. There is nobody. They're just a figment of you, okay? In this scenario, played out for a day, what's that like? Played out for a year, what's that like? Where you have total control, where you are all knowing and all powerful. Was well, probably pretty cool for a day, right? played out for two days, now three days. Nothing can come. You can't get hurt. You can't die. You don't need to sleep. You don't need to eat. You don't need anything. You don't need anyone. Played out for a lifetime. How about eternity? 
what a boring and lonely world this is going to be. You're going to want to hit the surprise button. You know, you're going to want some risks, some, some mystery, some adventure, some unknown, some diversity, some others, some company, some companionship. What a boring and lonely world it becomes in a world full of just you, you know? And if you were to actually experience like the flip side of life, right? Because we have this now, we're in constant companionship and communion with others who are totally different and infinitely unique from us all the time. You would come to the conclusion that this is actually pretty good. This is great. You know, we are, we have a sense of, of, or an opportunity to, actually get to know others, to grow, to share this experience of life and this journey, to have a meaningful role in others' lives and in the, in the, you know, in the, in the way that this world unfolds. You know, this is an incredible opportunity, just being born a human without you having to do anything. You know, when a human being is born, we're, it's totally different than any other being. When a bug is born, it can take off in the air and fly right away, right? There's nothing it has to learn or do. All of its actions it's gonna take its entire life are present and fixed through its genetics and its heredity. It's right there at birth. When a deer is born, it can take off on a sprint within minutes, right? Right. But when a human being is born, we're the most helpless creature on the face of the earth. And that's because we are born fundamentally differently than any other being on this planet. And that is with magnitudes, more degrees of freedom that life for us can be an open-ended book. We can choose to show up and be interested in people or just wait our turn to talk. We can choose to be creative or to be destructive, to be nice, to be mean, to be accepting, to be intolerant. We have the opportunity to be a gift, to take an active role in this world. And that's totally different. And that right there is an incredible opportunity. You know, when we're sitting here as human beings with, with all this freedom that people use in so many ways that make people wish we were not so free, I don't think people understand the opportunity through freedom. Through, you can receive things, freedom, things become a gift. Okay. Right. So, so hold on a second. Go ahead. <clears throat> The, the conversations that I've been having lately, there's this big push against the freedom, kind of, they don't call it that, but it's more about what's your civic responsibility? What's your duty to others? What's your, you know, what your actions do so much contribute to other people's lives, good or bad, that you have a civic duty to say, um, wear a mask or, you know, quarantine yourself in a hole in the ground where you can't see sunshine and you can't see people and you can't, you know, do the things that make life worth living because it's your civic duty to not do the things that make life worth living because you might possibly die otherwise. And see, to me, that's like just death while I'm living, while I'm breathing. So how do we balance those two? Well, the word responsibility is interesting because its meaning has literally been reversed to the opposite, okay? So responsibility, I think it's responded from Latin. It, it doesn't mean what it means today. Responsibility today means your, your duty, your obligation. It's what you have to do, right? It used to mean your ability to respond and your ability to respond is totally different, right? Responsibility is what you have to do. Your ability to respond is what you can do. It's possibilities, right? And obligations reduces possibilities down to one. Okay. So I want the personal responsibility is not an obligation and a duty and something that you owe to the world. You know, this is some kind of new drudgery religion, in my opinion. You know, the opportunity here for people to take an active role and to be a gift to the world is not about you fulfilling your obligation and paying your debts. This is about you getting a sense of meaning and fulfillment out of life. And this is an opportunity. You know, when 
for example, like we just interviewed a comedian the other day talking about jokes. Jokes are a really interesting thing. When you share a joke with somebody, jokes only have value after you've heard them the first time when you give them to others. You enjoy jokes again when other people laugh at them. It is by giving them up and sharing them and putting them in other people's worlds that you get value out of it. Well, it's the same thing with life. When I'm sitting here and just thinking about myself and serving myself, yeah, that can be fun. I surfed hurricanes and skydived and base jumped and it's a great adrenaline rush, but it doesn't contribute meaning to anybody else's life. And so to do what the waves and the ocean and the mountains did for me for other people creates an endless opportunity to see that, get that same enrichment through other people's eyes. There's science on this. This isn't woo-woo mystical nonsense. You know, this, there's science that shows that when a human being does an act of kindness, for example, for another person that's doing something without the expectation of getting anything in return, it creates a chemical cocktail in the brain of dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin, the love chemical that bonds people together. I mean, we're talking about a high in people that's extremely pleasant and natural too. And it doesn't just happen in the person receiving the act of kindness. Guess what? It happens in the giver of the act of kindness. And it happens in everybody who observes the act of kindness and three degrees out. So if you want to talk about getting what uh, I got from surfing from the rest of life and everywhere else, this is it, buddy. This isn't an obligation. There's no obligation for anybody to do anything but be a non-contributing zero in this world. All right. That's the baseline. You don't owe anybody anything, but the opportunity and the benefit, if you do, is you get to experience what it's like to live a full life. That's what Henry Thoreau talked about. To dig deep, suck the marrow from life, you know, so that I will not, when I come to die, discover that I had not lived. Right. It's, when you're surrounded by gifts, that is to be rich. Yeah. And that's the opportunity. That's it. There's no obligation. Light. That's the other one, you know, rage, rage against the dying of the light. It's a Dylan, well, Dylan Thomas, not Bob. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that that saying to me is like you must commit yourself to fully express life from within because life is light and we don't want to extinguish that in people and you know this whole world that we're living in right now is is uh an interesting cancel culture it's this uh political correctness it's this mm -hmm this level of responsibility being what, 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 what they're calling being woke, right? There's two people who are woke, one side and the other side. They're, we're, I'm woke because I'm politically correct, or I'm woke because I can see the conspiracy, or I'm woke because whatever it is. Like, are you really, have you come out of the dream? because I don't see the world shifting out of the dream of separation right now. I see this divisiveness because people don't know how to talk to, get to each other without being in full on reaction and being in, you know, I do it myself. What I love about doing these podcast interviews is that I'm forced to listen and listen clearly so that I have what you're saying to me in the forefront of my response rather than what I want to say to you because I got reacted to something you said, right? So I had a reaction to it. But uh, so I love this format of interview because it forces me to learn more and more and more how to listen. And I think that's a skill set that. Uh, that we're lacking in, in society right now. Nobody's really listening for the nuance, for the common sense, for the critical thinking, for the, the, you know, the minutia. They're only responding to the generality and reacting to 
their own um, echo chamber, basically. Which is a delusion. It's a total delusion that your image of other people is them. It's not. It's a caricature. I mean, the mind, I don't think that this is a evil thing that, you know, people on the left and the right or whatever, or the top and the bottom think that the other is always, you know, this greedy bastard trying to do everybody in. I don't, I don't think so. I think it's like maybe in our evolutionary development, it's the mind likes to conserve calories. And so it's easier rather than looking at a person like you're looking at them for the first time every single time you look at them, is this human a tiger or is this, you know, a, a mouse? What is it, you know, to, to make a shortcut, you know, to take a little snapshot. But eventually we built up this mental collage of mental images that I think can blind us to the truth. You know, it's like the map we're holding up in front of the territory. And when the territory changes and doesn't match the map, which happens like an actual map, like, you know, the landscape pushes up mountains and opens up canyons and rivers meander and people change, buddy, you know? And so our maps need to be refreshed. We have to be able to listen to each other or else what? We'll end up with a civil war or a civil conflict. You know, we're going to have riots in the streets and uh, what's going to happen when the other, this is what happened in the Parthiad. People became cockroaches right? This is what happened in, in uh, the, the Holocaust. This is what happens in war when people become enemy combatants rather than people. We're, as soon as you can set up a caricature of another person, you can say and do things to a caricature that you would never do to a human being. And so it's, it's time for a refresh. It's time to start listening to each other and overcome the polarization that I think, and dehumanization that is alienating us. Right. So to me, that's, that's because the labels, like I would love it if we didn't have any of these labels, red, blue, left, right, snowflake. It's always red and blue, isn't it? Bloods and crips. I mean, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it, I was actually uh, looking at, at the, the red and blue map and the song from Colors popped in my head. I don't know if anybody remembers Colors, the movie, with Sean Penn and Robert Duvall back in the eighties. But uh, you know, there's a song colors and uh, it was like red and blue crips and bloods. It just don't matter. Gonna fly for your life when my shotgun scatters, you know, it's like this, this, uh, this concept of if you live on this block, you're okay because I live on this block. But if you live on that block, no longer are you okay. Cause you're now on the opposite block. And and I'm not going to go to your block either. So don't come to mine because I'm not going there, right? <laughs> this it's tribalism. Kind of. Tribalism is interesting because, and I, I'm writing a book actually called Tribal Living in a Modern World, the Corporate Culture Revolution. I'm going to do a series of these. And to me, there, there's a massive benefit to going back to a tribalized kind of a culture, meaning purpose-driven culture, not, um, not just living next to, you know, people because they happen to live there, but like creating um, communities that are purpose-driven. So like my, maybe one community, and, and this is for, for corporations, but let's say, uh, you know, you have a corporation and it's an engineering company. Well, you got engineers in one space, you got accountants in the other space, you got finance people in the other space, you got marketing people in the other space, and nobody is really connected that are in the same projects. And so if you took those people, put them in their projects, now you have this tribe, this family that is all going for the same goal. Your productivity goes up, uh, people flaking on you goes down because they're kind of accountable to their family, right? versus this individualized in your boxes, in your cubicles, in your, you know, corporate offices, that kind of thing. But in the other respect of, of tribal, right, is that brutality of, well, if you don't perform, then you're out, you're ostracized, you're gone, right? So 
the, the meaning of tribal has has taken itself into several places, but I I like those tribal cultures of like sitting around a campfire and talking about the day, talking about what you guys are going to do tomorrow, talking about how you're feeling, you know, whatever it is, but that, that circle around a campfire has always been in my head as the place it's like sitting around a dinner table, the place that we're missing that, that level of community connection. We don't have dinner with our families anymore because everybody's working. So there's, you know, the, the family dinner time is, is kind of, you know, going by the wayside and that, those kinds of things to me are, are tribal, but I'll let you continue with your <laughs> definition and, and so forth of it. No, no, no. I, I think you hit the nail on the head. I mean, I think that there's aspects of, it's interesting. I've never heard it framed as tribal life, but I would, but what I used to think of as like smaller, more intimate community life you know, has extreme benefits. You know, we live in large societies where you meet somebody on the street, you'll never see them again. You're basically on the internet, you know, and there's no natural social consequences. If you act like a jerk or do things unfriendly, you don't lose friends. You don't, there's no friends. They're strangers. They're all strangers. But in a community, if you act like unfriendly, you're going to lose friends. You ha if you act like a jerk, you have to wake up and you have to see that person tomorrow. And not just be in their company, but real communities often have a lot of interreliance. You rely on these people. And so there's, there's, I think there's less need for artificial consequences. Like you don't need 35 million laws all backed by felonies and jail time and, and our bloated prison and criminal justice system because you can replace it with natural social consequences. I also think that it humanizes things a bit. You actually know people beyond the surface and it helps get past the caricature phenomenon of uh, uh, objectifying people. You know, there's an interesting uh, researcher, his name was, I think, Dunbar, and he came up with, he researched people and chimpanzees and, and species. And he realized that there's like, there's a limit to the amount of relationships any individual person or chimpanzee can, can hold before it becomes uh, really inefficient to, to act as a group, but just abstract. Like you can only have so many real friends before it's no longer, you can't maintain them. There's no, they're no longer real friends, they're, they're acquaintances, right? And you don't really know those people. But at that line, right, is, is a real line where communities become, I guess, somewhat tribal, right? Like you can't be, we can't be, I don't even think we're a real country of 340 million people. Like what, where our real sense of togetherness is maybe with a few people in our lives right now, you know, but the tribalism that we usually traditionally use this here that the term being used in is political. And it's weird because community's gone. People don't have community. They don't even know their neighbors to a large degree and politics or political identity or, or belonging has taken its place. So now people feel a sense of unity or togetherness and identify with people who share the same political views or political affiliations rather. It's really partisan tribalism, yeah. not just like we, we have the same purpose, we have the same beliefs, because it's not. There's actually, if you, if you really talk to people about um, the principles behind people's certain policy positions, there's a huge discrepancy. Everybody, even I'm guilty of it, between our personal beliefs and our political ideologies. Because at that level, it just becomes so abstract. When you're talking about supranational macroeconomic policies, you know, you and I, we, I mean, nobody's got the whole picture. There's nobody who's all knowing and all powerful here and got it all figured out. And so when we go to school and we see our kid in the lunch line and, uh, you know, you know, Brad is beating up Johnny for his lunch money, you know, we're like, hey, stop that. You don't take people's things. He can give it to you if he wants to. Well, then you talk about the IRS and everybody's like, oh, well, you got to pay your taxes. 
You know, we have huge discrepancies between between the way that we actually believe that we should get along and the way that we vote and the policies and the, the parties that we think are, are okay. And so I think that that is really the, la the lack of community. And we've shifted this need for a sense of community and belonging to politics. Everything is politics. We're homo politicus. The news has one perspective. You know, you got ABC, and, and CNN and you got Fox News and whatever else. And everyone's like, oh, they're so different. No, they're the same. Everything they talk about is through the lens of politics and government. There is no other dimension of human life that you get viewed through the media. It's all politics. And that is the exact same background, you know? And, but there's so many other dimensions of human life. Yeah. Where is community? Yeah, you know, I, I miss the voice and that's the way it was because that period of time, it was a revolutionary period when TV was just coming out and news was literally fact telling. We just told the fact. There was the, the, the news channels were not allowed. Walter Cronkite. To, they, were, they, they were not allowed to be profit builders. They weren't allowed to be things that made money. Government was telling them, basically, the FCC said, you cannot make money off your news. And so it was, news was fact. Commentary was commentary, but news was fact. That's the way it was. And I think it was in the 70s or late 70s, early 80s, maybe when, when Reagan was president that he started doing all of the, the um, deregulation and they deregulated things like pharmaceuticals being allowed to be advertised to people on TV and billboards and stuff like that. It never was allowed to do that before. Um, and then also things like news was made to be allowed to be a for-profit, which is why they started with that 24-hour news cycle eventually, because, oh, well, we can be a profit. Great. Let's, <laughs> the more we do, the more advertisement we get, the more money we make. And then the advertisement became who, who's the big money companies, the pharmaceutical companies. So they're advertising on the news. You know, if you watch news right now, who's the advertisers? The majority of the advertisers. It's the pharmaceutical companies, the agricultural companies, food companies that are processed food companies pr pretty much. I mean, you don't really see much about organic and healthy foods. So the, the messaging that, be, that came out of that deregulation is whatever we're doing is always good because that's what we did before. And so now we can sell you on the stuff that we're doing and it may or may not be good for you. And that is the intellectual property that you're sucking in your brain, as well as the food that you're sucking in your mouth, the pill that you're taking, the, the shot that you're having. I mean, it's all the same uh, on the, that same level, but that's the history of when that started to come, come to, you know, to pass that, that everything we started to hear and it was a slow ramp up, but nowadays it's, like always like the, the 10 second, seven second sound bites it was a slow ramp up to that. You know, back when I was a kid, it was a two minute commercial, not a 30 second commercial or a 10 second commercial. Right. And so that's where people, I think, started to get programmed more into this idea that the things that they're seeing aren't correct, aren't real news. And now there's this trepidation about everything that you see. Either we believe it fully or we don't believe it at all, depending on who you are, right? So the messaging that we're getting is really confusing to people, is it not? Oh, absolutely. Our attention span is, well, according to Google, seven seconds. We're almost at, we've almost beat out the goldfish for the shortest attention span. <laughs> and you know, what's crazy is it's, it's a weird 
kind of feedback loop because, you know, people complain about the media and social media uh, creating echo chambers, right? But really their algorithms were designed. We brought on uh, Jason Pfeiffer of editor-in-chief Entrepreneur Magazine to talk about this, this social dilemma. He was telling us that, I mean, their algorithms are designed to show us what we want, right? And so we're just always getting more and more or really even only and exclusively what we want or what the algorithms, or at least we're, we're showing the algorithms we want. And I think that there's a weird space here where like whatever it is that is gonna hold our attention ends up being shown to us by the algorithms. But even if it's a, a human, the news is showing us what sells. And I don't think people realize the power that we have in that to make a difference. I mean, it wasn't too long ago, there was no organic option in food. There was no consumer label to even let people know what's GMO, what's not, what's organic and what's not, what's anything and not, what's got, what's got in it. There was no nutrition label. I mean, it was literally nothing. And then all of a sudden people advocated and wanted consumer choice. And it was because there was a market for it. Now you have 94% of millennials who say they will switch which brand they buy a product or service from if they know that it is supporting a cause they believe in or something. We have a new consumer market that's transforming the whole institution of business for good. And it's happening because of the conscious consumers out there that's growing. It's value-based decisions. It's no longer just, I'm going to make my buying choices based off convenience and and price, people will sacrifice, 60% of consumers say they will sacrifice price and convenience to support a brand that they, they believe in, right? And these are, and that's why you see every company website getting greenwashed with how carbon neutral they are and how, how many trees they planted this year. You know, it's because that's what people want now. What people want is shifting. And because of that, the boss of business is making different decisions because we are that boss. You know, and I think there's a huge opportunity there. Like, why does Joe Rogan and Jordan Peterson and Brett Weinstein have an audience in the first place? It's because, you know, the institution of mainstream media sucks. It's because people are going somewhere else. They're voting with their feet and their dollars. And that's a strong signal to mainstream media that what people want is different. And so if you want to exist you've got to be able to provide, meet, meet the new needs of the market. And that's a huge power. You and I are having a podcast, in fact, because of this shift in the market, right? And I totally agree. I think that there's nothing preventing any media institution from being a nonprofit. In fact, there's nothing preventing any government department from being a nonprofit. Everything in the government that's being done could be funded voluntarily through, through a nonprofit. In fact, the government usually duplicates a lot of services that nonprofits are already doing, and they just compete with them using your tax dollars. There's nothing preventing anybody from doing things in, in a nonprofit way. It costs you as an individual $150 to set up a nonprofit and get started. All right. And we have the internet and technology and Kickstarters and, and start fun. There's all kinds of ways that you as an individual can get connected and get things going right now. So if anybody thinks this is a problem, I mean, there's never been a better time to be the solution. Yeah, absolutely. So how do, how do we, you know, people go from really focused on the problem to focused on the solution and uh, I'll give you just a, a quick example of what I'm talking about. So my buddy, AJ Ali, is a film producer and um, media expert and things like that. He's, uh, he did a movie called Walking While Black, Love is the Answer. And it's basically going through his story of walking down the street in his neighborhood in, uh, in Maryland I think it was in Baltimore and getting harassed and guns pulled on him by police and how 
he basically, you know, defended himself uh, by calling his attorney and saying, if you want to talk to my attorney, he's right here. And so they ended up harassing him for almost a year, stopping him for walking while black in the wrong neighborhood. And even though it was his neighborhood. And, but what he did with it wasn't just complain that I'm black and I'm walking around and people are harassing me, right? He created a solution to it. Love is the answer, which uh, I don't remember all of the LOV, but it's like, uh, listen to people who are different than you. Understand them. The, the O was, uh, is um, some, I don't remember though. Uh, the V is volunteer to be a part of the solution. You know, it's like he created this whole program. Now this program has gone out to police station after police station after police station. The movie uh, has been uh, picked up by the NFL and they're taking it into some of the police stations, some of the players. He created a solution to the problem that he saw in front of him rather than just complaining about the issue as, as it is. And he's an activist. He takes an active role. That's what activist means is you're taking an active role in the thing that you believe the most about. And so that's the question is I want to spark through this show, through the things that we say here, I want to spark a mass of activism and people taking action on whatever it is they believe in. Because frankly, I don't care what you believe in. You're not going to offend me. Uh, my roommate who happens to be my co-dad is, you know, kind of like an interesting guy because, you know, he hates everybody equally. And I, you know, and he says, I hate them all equally, especially my own people. And that's just because I love them as equally, right? He, he's, he's an interesting guy, but we don't agree on much of anything <laughs> when it comes to certain things that way. But we're like close friends. We, you know, we, we have an affinity towards each other We're a we, and we love having the debate. That's even the, the, the better thing because we'll start debating and we'll argue and we'll fight and then we'll come up with a solution and find out where we're same and where we're different and what the, those differences are. It's an interesting dynamic, frankly. But the point is, <laughs> is that um, activism for solution rather than complain about a problem and then connect with people who are diverse from your thoughts so that you can increase your perception of the world through other people's reality. No, I think you nailed it. I think you absolutely nailed it. That's so interesting that, that you guys are complete opposites. My wife and I too, uh, she's from Sweden, you know, she grew up, you know, with more, more socialist culture. Actually, I think they are not quite socialist according to their government, but anyway, uh, people say, well, what's that like being married to a socialist being, you know, with your views? I said, well, you know, uh, uh, she takes half my paycheck, but great benefits, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I'll tell you, so there's a difference between being I mean, these people you're talking about, are, that, that's an entrepreneur, but it's a different kind of entrepreneur. It's, it's like a social entrepreneur and, you know, starting a nonprofit and trying to make a difference. It's, it's no different than entrepreneurship. You know, when people want, I mean, everything in this room, everything in your pocket and everything that we're using to make this podcast right now was once the idea of somebody who said, how can I, what can I do to improve people's lives through a product or service? And that's how nonprofits start too. It's usually somebody who sees something going on and they think of a way to, to fix it or create value. And that's what they do. And people do this every single day in their lives as parents with their kids. <clears throat> you know, there's, there's nowhere we're not doing it. And what your, buddy, what your buddy did is very common. It's called a public awareness campaign. Most problems are exacerbated by the degree to which they remain in the dark. And so raising awareness around them and shedding light on them. And I don't mean like spotlight, like, you know, cancel culture, we're going to shine, shut this voice out, solve a problem, but raising awareness around, no one can fix a problem if they don't understand it. You know what I mean? And so why do people know what the purple, the, the pink ribbon means? Why do people know what the ice bucket challenge is? 
These are really creative ways that people raised awareness around a cause that they cared about and money to solve a problem. And there's nothing pre preventing anybody from doing the same thing and raising awareness around the issues that they care about the most. You can also start a business and be a real entrepreneur. There are products and services that solve people's problems all day long. Everything in this room is. You can also though, most problems in one way or another are also exacerbated by the absence of strong community or toxic or unhealthy community, you know, and, and the police relations that you're talking about is also exacerbated by that. Our community can strongly affect uh, issues, especially social issues. You know, in California, police are afraid to go and arrest somebody for a joint, even though it's illegal, because, you know, millionaires are walking around looking like homeless people. You know, the, the community's totally different. They don't know who they're going to arrest. They're going to end up losing their job, getting suspended. This guy's got some powerful lawyers. You know, we can change that, that culture and the community and build a stronger and a healthier one. And uh, that can really help a lot of the social issues that people care about. But you can also actually reform or supplement or innovate uh, within the existing institutions if there's a problem too. There was a person, Melanie Armstrong in Mississippi who she started a small business. She wanted to do African hair braiding. And she was told that she wasn't allowed to and needed permission. She had to go and get a, uh, a license to braid hair. And this was actually set up and lobbied by the brick and mortar uh, cosmetology businesses who didn't want any competition in Mississippi. And so it was $10,000 to get this license and, and over like 10,000 hours in school. I mean, it was more, more training than you needed to be an EMT or a firefighter or a policeman or anything. It was ridiculous. And hair braiding wasn't even in it. Yeah, go ahead. Old doctors, um, college is approximately 3,800 hours. That's in, that's full through their internship. Uh, chiropractors, it's about 4,200 hours, but that's for a doctorate. That's, that's a seven year, eight year committed degree with an internship. That's how many hours it is. And so, yeah, 10,000 is quite a bit, especially for braiding hair. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, don't quote me on that. It could be 2001. It could be seven. I, I don't actually remember the number. I can barely remember my kids' birthdays, but it was a significant amount of hours and ridiculous. Yeah. Um, but people can supplement and, and fight that. You know, we fought some occupational licensing barriers here in Texas to try and uh, protect uh, some complementary and alternative medical innovators and oncologists in Houston uh, from a witch hunt by the Texas Medical Board. You know, and people, people can fight back and create more accountability and try and remove some of these barriers to people improving others' lives and, and succeeding in doing so. And here, so we had an oncologist, Dr. Brzezinski, who he had found out that some cancers have a genetic component to them. And through the epigenetic process, right, you can, you can affect genes. You can turn on and off their expression uh, using certain foods and, and pharmaceutical compositions. And so he would do this and he would treat cancer patients. And according to the definition of what a cure means, which is five years without it returning, he cured many cancer patients who had cancers that were uh, uh, exacerbated by genetic conditions. And what he, what he did at the time was an innovation. It had never been done. He was a medical innovator, right? But instead of being a hero, the Texas Medical Board tried to take his license and the FDA and they'd been on a witch hunt for a decade. And this guy had spent million, tens of millions of dollars just fighting to keep trying to save lives. And he's just improving people's lives. And he's a successful practice. You know, he's got a big building. And um, so what happened was the Texas Medical Board comprised of mostly uh, tr traditional doctors. And, and maybe I think they allowed one chiropractor on the board recently and they had to fight for that. Uh, they didn't like competition. And so they had really narrowly defined what's called the, the standard of care. And the standard of care is defined by whatever is the standard of the day is acceptable if you wanna keep your license. 
So everybody's got a permission slip and they can yank your permission slip if you act outside of the status quo of treatment and what's acceptable today. So here's this medical, so it makes all medical innovation an act of civil disobedience. So this guy, and here's the crazy thing. At the time they were th trying to take his license and put him on trial, it had already become the standard of care. It was being done all over the place. Okay, but it wasn't the standard of care at the time that he invented it. And so they were threatening to take his license. So this is an example of a barrier that a lot of people face. Right now, when kids say, what do you want to be when you grow up? And they say, I want to be X, whatever it is. They have a one in four chance that they're going to be told they don't have permission. And they're going to have to go through some of the, the barriers that this doctor and other complementary alternative medical doctors and Melanie Armstrong in Mississippi go through called an occupational licensing. And much of it is not for your safety. It's anti-competitive business practices that our institution of business is still engaging in by going to their politicians and saying, you know what? There's a safety issue that you don't know about because you're a politician and you're not in my field. And you should create a law that blocks other people from engaging in this profession until they've, they've, they can pay to play. Right. And it's a major issue. Yeah. So anyway, there's lots of ways people can engage in, in change. And that's, that's some of them. You can reform and, and innovate. Yeah. I, I know, I know Dr. Brzezinski or I know of his, him and his story. I, I had, because I'm in the medical field, we had a, a functional medicine practitioner. She was a gynecologist in uh, Orlando and she got her entire practice like raided because the AMA, which is pretty much the mob, the medical mob, uh, didn't like the fact that, that she on a regular basis had patients that would show up for visits and not be prescribed something. So the standard of care, as you were saying, the standard of care is that within four visits, they either need a prescription or a procedure. If they don't get a prescription or a procedure, meaning a pharmaceutical prescription, not, not maybe a supplement, not maybe like, an, a, like exercise for, a, you know, for a while and a lifestyle prescription, but a pharmaceutical prescription or a procedure or a medical procedure. Because she didn't do that, the AMA and the uh, Florida Department of Health decided that they wanted to investigate her and literally ripped apart her office, took all her files. I mean, talk about breaking HIPAA law just by, by raiding an office and taking the, the, the doctor files. And why? Because standard of care. Uh, the standard of care sucks. The standard of care <clears throat> in medicine is absolutely horrific. It's, you know, seven minutes max in an office these days, uh, according to the insurance companies. Uh, so, you know, you can't even get your story across, let alone get them to understand what's going on with your body mm -hmm. enough for them to be able to, to treat you. And it's, uh, it's fairly ridiculous. You know, the system as a whole has, um, you know, this is a harsh word, but it's raped the health of American, you know, public. I mean, and it, and it has nothing to do with the doctor's. It has nothing, the, the doctors are here trying to be of service. The system that they're in is bullying and intimidating, threatening them every day with their livelihood. Because if you're out of school with a couple, you know, a quarter of a million to half a million dollar debt, and now you're being threatened because you're practicing, you know, without the standard of care, you could lose your license. Now, all of a sudden that debt is completely <laughs> unpayable and you can't even work in your, in your profession. It's, it's, I mean, if people knew to the depths of their knowledge, what is really happening in the medical world and how much the monetary system is affecting, you know, what, happens in people's health, I don't think that they would stand for it. Maybe they would, but I don't, I think people know that it's broken. They just don't know why and how. So, and we're doing it. Yeah, we, we, it is, 
It is our fault, I have to say. And I mean everybody. That none of this machinery turns without the gears of each and every single one of our participation. We are the system. And I I just, you know, when you were talking, I'm sitting here thinking about the the standard of care and the issue. It does suck. This this whole situation. But it's and it's not the doctors, it's the one size fits all approach that's top down. It doesn't work. It stifles creativity and innovation out because you're, you're trying to micromanage from a distance and it doesn't work in giant corporations and it doesn't work in giant governments and it doesn't work in the medical industry. It doesn't work in any practice. When you're <clears throat> trying to dictate what everybody should do, you have different people with different needs. Every single person is a unique individual with different problems. And it's, there is no one size fits all. It doesn't work in education. Any teacher who walks in a room and try into a third grade classroom and tries to teach to the statistically average third grader misses every single person in that room. No one is the perfect statistical average. Kids are all over the place and they're all over the place in different areas of their learning. It's the same in the medical field. You can't prescribe a one size fits all for anything. And so the top down approach that we have is really the problem. And you know whose fault it is? It's the people who do top down thinking. Who's going to become the decision makers? Who comprises the people making and enforcing the, the decisions? We do. And you know what? Who thinks top down? We do. Let me give you an example. I used to do this workshop. Well, actually, I used to masquerade around as a substitute teacher uh, so that I could test out my social experiments and workshops on unsuspecting audiences. So I went into this classroom and I did this experiment and I said, okay, today, guys, we're going to change the world. So here's what I want you to do. I was in Sweden. It was an international uh, high school and this was a conversational English class. So I can do whatever I want as long as it's in English. So I say, okay, get into groups identify what's one thing you want to see change in the world more than anything else. All right. Then two, what's the best plan you can think of to make it happen. And three, do it in English, come up and present. Okay. So boom, get in the groups. All right. Five minutes has elapsed and they're all done back in their seats. And I'm impressed. I'm like, wow, you guys solved all the world's problems in five minutes. Come on up. Let's hear it. Bachelor number one. So they come on up and here's kind of what it sounded like. Well, we think that poverty is a big issue and what the prime minister should do is da, 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 da. the next person. Well, we think that the uh, uh, criminal justice system is a big issue and do you know what the mayor should do is da, 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 da. Well, we think that the environment is a big issue and you know what the UN should do is. And I realized something. They're all top-down answers. <laughs> Nobody had anything that they could walk out the door and actually do. And this is extremely disempowering. And I did this all across the United States in schools as well. And you know what? It's the exact same outcome. Everybody is thinking in terms of top-down solutions. They're thinking in terms of what the president should do. And when everybody's doing that, you know what everybody's not doing? Anything to solve any problems. That's right. It's all somebody else. And the worst part about it is when, you, when you're thinking in terms of top-down solutions, we are creating and supporting and acquiescing to one-size-fits-all solutions. Because you know what? 500 people in Washington, D.C. cannot logistically, it's impossible, solve all the problems of 340 million people across a continent that they've never met and don't know anything about. It is science. It is impossible to do. And this is a giant delusion that we have that we're going to solve our problems through top-down thinking. We are creating the problem. You know the Einstein quote, you can't solve a problem in the same level of awareness that's creating it? Right. This is us, guys. Hello, you want to be woke, wake up. We need to start thinking from the bottom up. And the medical industry is a perfect example of it. 
Yeah, absolutely. You know, people t- talk to me all the time about how bad big government is and how bad government is and how bad big businesses and how bad, you know, these things are. And I'm like, so who's running the company? The show. Who's, who's running the company? <laughs> who's running the government? It, it, is that person a person? Is it, is it a, is it like people, the, you know, like, oh, the, the deep state, right? Are they people? Because if they're people, then we had those people, you know, through sex. And then we raised those people through our ideals. And then they started acting on our ideals when they got to those places of power. That sounds like the people to me. So why is it that, why do you think that people want to separate themselves from the thing that that they created and then hold it up to some highest, you know, position of authority that can overthrow or overtake or uh, overwhelm over (laughs) the people, the people? Because to me, it's like, we are the people. Oh, that's a saying, isn't it? Somewhere? <laughs> Somewhere. I heard that once. Maybe it was in a movie. I don't know. Why do we have this, 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 this necessitated in our minds story? of the entity versus the people running the entity? Because nothing is evil inherent of itself. Government is not evil. Governmental systems are not evil. People are the people who do the things can be evil or just the things that they're doing could be, let's take it away from evil versus good, right? Lack of optimization versus optimized. Or error or ignorance. We're all acting in ignorance. We don't have the full picture. I think there's a lot more innocence to the picture than, than, than people think. And the systems that we have, they oftentimes do create barriers, but there are no systems without people. It all comes back to the, we are, are peopling this. We are the gears and the machinery of it. And we give away our power way too easily. You know, the, the scene from They Live where the preacher's standing up saying, they are our owners. They own us. We're controlled. We love to find a perpetrator and to play the victim. And there's a kind of virtuosity and and righteousness about it. I don't think today that we know how to solve a problem without creating an enemy. We have this this war mentality that we have to find an enemy, polarize it, isolate them and attack them. You know, that's our approach to Corona. That's our approach to everything. We have the war on drugs, the war on poverty, the war on tip, more war on everything you know, war on disease, we're going to war it all, right? And the problem is, is when you go around looking for a perpetrator, you're always in the victim story, and you give away your power. And the power that people have is incredible. You know, when my kids were born, uh, I'll give you a good example. My first kid was born, Jessica, she's four years old now. Um, They, she was born, she didn't look like the name that we picked out, right? which was Olivia. I was like, she doesn't look like that. She looks like a Jessica. So I was, they said, well, what do you want to name her? We have to write something down. And I said, I don't know. I'm sorry. And so all of a sudden, this beautiful birth process, because they got afraid, they have requirements to fill out an application of live birth, turned into like a bureaucratic proceeding. And any time that somebody tries to, to turn one of the most meaningful experiences of my life into a bureaucratic legal proceeding, I'm going to push back. So we didn't sign any paperwork. So we're driving away. They're literally stuffing paperwork in the window to sign as we're driving away. So she ended up with, you know, no social security number, no birth certificate. Um, I, I think there is a birth certificate. It probably says baby read somewhere, but we didn't have any of that. And then you know, okay, here we are a few months later and my wife's ready to go visit her family in Sweden so they can meet our first child. And she says, okay, great. We need a passport. Nick, you have to figure this out. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I send in the application and uh, um, I sent in so much documentation to establish 
citizenship and identity. It was a, I mean, it was like a, a novel thicker than your book and it had everything in it and they didn't even look at it. I just got Johnny, you know, processor sent me this automated boilerplate letter that said, sorry, no social, no birth certificate. Uh, your application has been put on, put on hold. Right. So I'm like raging against the system right now. Oh, the bureaucracy. Oh, we got, this is our life, you know? And I said, hold on a second. Every single part of the system I'm raging against is made up of and created by and run by human beings. So I call up the passport agency and somebody answers and they say, hello, this is so-and-so, you know, at the passport, blah, blah, blah. Can I help you? And I say, yes, can I speak to your supervisor? And so I get a supervisor on the phone and she says, hello, this is so-and-so, the supervisor. And I say, yes, can I speak to your supervisor? I say, okay, sure. And I do this until there is no more supervisors. And then I say, hi, look, I'm about to become a casualty in the bureaucratic process here. Please help me. And let me explain what's going on. It would really make my day if you could call this processor and tell them to actually look at the documentation that we sent because we got a plane to, to catch and she's a citizen and all this. And uh, you know what this person did? This person said, yeah, absolutely. And wrote up this nice long email and sent it to him. The hold was removed off of our our, our passport application the next day, the passport came in the mail with no birth certificate, no social security number. We flew on our way and everybody got to meet the baby and we lived happily ever after. And you know what? Ever since then, I can't get myself to rage against an abstract system ever again because the humanity came through and I've experienced it. I have tasted it. And I've tasted it over and over and over again, because I looked for it, because I was curious about it. And I found it, but you won't find it if you're not looking for it, but it is there. Everything is done by humans in the human world. Right. By definition. You were kind also. That, that, that's yeah. something that, that uh, eludes a lot of people is the, the part of it where it's like the kindness got you the result had you had you approached her differently that person that you spoke with you might not have gotten the humanity right but you approached a human with humanity and then you got the humanity i i find it fascinating when i have to call customer service and the person says well that's not our policy and then i ask for a supervisor and the supervisor will say, oh yeah, no problem. We can do that. I'm like, so why is it the policy to tell the person that it's not the policy <laughs> so that they have to get frustrated, right? So that they, it's like, it's like purposeful frustration. And I don't know if, if that's like a point. The point is somebody gets too frustrated so they don't bother so that they get their extra 10 bucks or a hundred bucks or whatever bucks, you know, like what, what's the, what is the purpose of the process that makes it so complicated to, to have humanity go, Oh, okay. Well, that makes sense. Right. A computer can't really go. That makes sense. An algorithm can't really go. Well, that makes sense. A person can though can and often doesn't and you know companies are changing the way that they operate too in a to a large degree they're decentralizing they're empowering their employees they're allowing them to make more decisions they're getting rid of a lot of the red tape and the process and barriers that have pre prevented people at at the uh, the front lines to create value and with massive results for a long time, we've had a top-down approach to running business too. And the approach has been that we know best and the employees on the front line don't know anything. So we're going to tell them what to say and we're going to pay them to be our robots. And so then when you do this, when you don't empower them, they take no ownership. It becomes your company, not their company. And they focus more on doing things right than doing the right thing. 
And so we got to shift out of the top down command and control mentality in business too. Yes. And once we do, we can empower people to know what to do without being told what to do and to be adaptable and flexible um, because they know the vision and the mission. We have the same purpose and where we're going and companies are doing that and they're winning the day and they're called conscious capitalist companies. They're called uh, self-governance organizations, according to the Legal Research Network. And over a 15 to 20 year span, we're talking long-term, these companies are outpacing the, the S&P 500 and the good to great companies, sometimes by 14 to one. I mean, we're talking extreme long-term profitability for companies that, that don't treat people like robots and don't try and create this burn and turn mentality, right? Yeah. I, I just, just to highlight a couple of Costco has- Oh, for sure. Great, great uh, work. You know, they do great work with their employees. They give them a lot of freedom. They pay them very well, um, pay for benefits. Even like UPS, uh, I think UPS, no, FedEx paid for, my friend was working there in high school. And then they paid for his college completely. And he still works for them now, 30 years you know, later. I mean- Bought it, his loyalty. Yeah, well, his loyalty was because they were loyal to him, right? Because he was able to own his position in that company. He had worked for UPS before he worked for FedEx. And they were a completely different culture at the time. You know, I don't know what their culture is now. But, uh, but yeah, the, the employee loyalty, I've done a lot of corporate wellness and corporate culture work. And one of the things that employers and HR reps need to really get their heads wrapped around and CFOs and COOs, but I mean, is that you put the freaking employees on the wrong side of the balance sheet, okay? Stop putting them on the deficit. Stop putting them on the on the the side of the balance sheet that makes them a liability and start putting them on the investment side of the sheet. Okay. <laughs> because you're not investing in your employees, which means you're not investing in your, in their families, which means you're not investing in your community, the community in which you exist in. And the only reason companies, and I really want you to take this as, uh, as much as I mean it, companies need to start having their responsibility to their people at the forefront of what they're doing because their productivity is dropped, their reputations are gone. I mean, you know, nobody wants to work for Walmart. They work there because they have to, but they don't want to, and they will leave as soon as possible. And then you got to hire and train a new person. And how much does that cost? What's the cost of employee turnover? What's the, what's the cost of retraining? What's the cost of sick days? What's the cost of having three hours of the day be productive while eight hour, while the other five are completely unproductive for the employee? What's that productivity cost? I mean, it is so against logic, in my logic at least, to not treat your employees like they're the freaking kings and queens of your company making your company work. It's just stupid. I mean, that's a really strong word to use, but it's just not smart. So, it is. And you'll create, you're going to inspire people who work against you. You know, 60% of employees, actually it's more than 60, but I don't remember the exact statistic, are disengaged, disengaged employees. And 17% of those disengaged are actively disengaged. You know what that means? That means disengaged means not creating value. Actively disengaged means actually they are actively undermining the value of that other 40, 30 to 40% who are engaged creating value. This is the cost. If you take, take 60% and, uh, uh, multiply that times the average salary in your business. Okay. Now add that as a cost. That's how much you're losing. You're losing 60% 
of everything that you're paying out to an employee who's disengaged or actively disengaged. And not only that, but the cost is 1.5 times what it is to keep an employee if you have to rehire and retrain and onboard a new employee and get them up to speed. We are wasting significant amounts of money if you're a person who only cares about money. You know? So the argument's there. You know, there's stories you get from Whole Foods, for example, who had the declaration of interdependence on their wall with all their different stakeholders. Mm-hmm. And you remember, Whole Foods sold to Amazon a few years back, right? And everybody knows why Amazon bought Whole Foods, but nobody knows why Whole Foods sold to Amazon. It's an interesting story. So Janus Partners, one of their uh, major shareholders, came to Whole Foods and said, you're paying your employees too much, too much benefits. You know, you're wasting a lot of money. We want you to squeeze all the other stakeholders. You know, we're going to have some good returns in the next quarter for our shareholders. And uh, they 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 stuck it to them and said, "No, nah, I don't think so." And we'll, we'll, we made some changes where uh, it made sense, but the rest of them they didn't make, according to John Mackey in his book Conscious Capitalism. And so Janus Partners went and got some other investors together, and they they created a coup and threatened proxy to the board, which means they're just going to fire everybody. And they said, okay, well, you got four days to make these changes or to sell the company. And so on the fourth day, he sold to Amazon, who he thought had some kind of affinity to try and keep the spirit alive. But John Mackey took in Whole Foods a what's called a multi-stakeholder approach. And this wasn't, this flies in the face of the, the philosophy that took a stronghold in the institution of business for like 50, 50 years or so which is the, the primacy of the shareholder, the shareholder's king, right? And everybody else is just uh, a cash cow, you know, to be exploited or something. And what companies realized is when you take a multi-stakeholder approach, you create a very long-term profitable and long-term sustainable business because you lose the burn and turn waste, okay? Just from an economic standpoint. But more than that, the markets have shifted employees, especially millennials today, who comprise the largest segment of the workforce, don't want another place where they're going to clock in and clock out. That's, that's the other generations. That's their parents, right? They don't want to do that. They want a place that appreciates them, where they feel they can have contribution, where they're going to enjoy the people that they work with and they feel trusted and you know, a sense of meaning and contribution. Like This is the new world. Yeah, and respected. I mean, that's, that's the other thing. People want to feel like the value that they're giving is, is being respected and being honored. And, um, you know, that's an interesting story about, about Amazon and how they ended up with whole foods. You know, we call it whole paycheck, but, (laughs) but, uh, you know, Amazon is an interesting company because Bezos the amount of money he personally put in his pocket throughout this COVID. I saw, I saw a, uh, a statistic. If he were to give, I think it was $110,000 to each and every single one of his employees, he would be back to the net worth that he was when, he, when Corona started. And he has like a hundred thousand something employees. That to me is like, okay, so these are the people who are out there on the forefront of your business, making your business happen. Wouldn't that be a way to honor them? Even if it wasn't that much. Right. And, uh, and so it's just an interesting, like $110,000 to the employees. What would that do for the economy for a hundred thousand people? However many of the, however many employees there are, that's a hundred thousand people. They all get a hundred thousand plus dollars. What would that do to the economy overall? What would they, what would those people do with the money? Probably spend it and probably spend it on Amazon and Probably it would go back to the company anyway, or at least other companies. And so this is where like the bank bailouts didn't make sense to me because if you're bailing something out, 
because they were stupid in their behavior, wouldn't it be better to pay the people, to give the money to the people that they were stupid about, you know? And then what are those people going to do with the money? They're probably going to freaking pay their bills. <laughs> you know, they're not going to hoard the money. They're not going to take it and say, oh, I'm, we're not lending it out anymore. You know, we're, we're being conservative now. We're, we're listening. <laughs> we're being conservative. They're going to spend the money and make it circulate. And one of the things that was really fascinating, I was watching an interview with the guy who, uh, what the Gordon Gecko was uh, on Wall Street was uh, made for, you know, the guy that, that was Gordon Gecko, I guess. And uh, his character was based off of, and he said, money is called um, circulation for a reason, right? You circulate money or currency, it's current because it needs to circulate. If it doesn't circulate, it has no purpose. And so money needs to go through this flow in order for it to be a value at all. And right now we have this situation where there's a lot of hoarding going on, right? Of money. There's lots of money in big pockets at that top end, like you were talking about. Not a lot of money at the bottom end. And not much is circulating, is being passed through the, the world, right? So if we were to create more, you know, balance with our actions and the money would circulate and all of a sudden our dollar would go up again. Right now, our dollar has basically plummeted. It's like not worth a whole lot. I mean, I, I was in London, dollar is not worth nearly what it was there. You know, Canada, not worth that. Paris, you know, not worth. <laughs> it's like we have devalued ourselves as a country and our currency in such tremendous ways that are so easy to fix, in my opinion. You know, the, the solutions are so easy if, if all we did was think outside of the box. Absolutely. There's an organization that was co-founded by Deepak Chopra. 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 I'm not sure I'm ever saying his name right when I say it. It's ah called Just Capital. And Just Capital champions and highlights uh, companies that are being more just or fair. And, and that's a pretty ambiguous term, but they poll, they do focus groups. They take all the top things that people say makes a just or an unjust company. And then they survey the United States about what people think about it and what people care about. And then they rank and order the largest companies according to those metrics, right? So it's all crowdsourced. It's very interesting. Yeah. And, and resource when we, uh, you know, give us that, that resource when, uh, for when we post. So yeah, absolutely. I believe it's justcapital.org. Okay. He's, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. So, so the companies are, they have this corporate tracker and I get these emails and they show me all the things, the cool things that companies have done during Corona to, to address the crisis that they didn't have to do. And it's things like the CEO, um, gave their salary to their employees. Everybody got kept their benefits, even though they had to do some, go down to part-time or everybody took voluntary time off in a coordinated effort so that nobody had to get fired, which is what Southwest Airlines did during the 2008 crisis. It's, they turned their distillery into, you know, making hand sanitizer, um, there's a lot of really cool things that companies have been doing that, that I hear about, not just through the corporate tracker of just capital that I get in my email as a you know, uh, principal entrepreneur wonk, but through stories from people who you know, are employees at places and who, who hear other stories about uh, what's being done. There's some really cool stories. And I think that there's 
there's a lot of principled entrepreneurs out there that are showing us a better way and people are picking up on it and people like that. And there's a lot of power we have to vote with our feet and vote with our dollars, a lot. And people who hear about something like that, like let's say there's not a lot of mutual benefit happening during Corona with Amazon between the CEO and their employees and somebody doesn't like that, um, they may go and find another marketplace. And Amazon may start to see an exodus. What it's going to take is people actually caring and people actually voting with their dollars and feet. It's very important. None of this happens without us. And you know what? Also, I, I talk about the, the shareholder and how much power they have. Every single person, if you have a savings account and you have to pay taxes on that one cent of dividends or you have a 401k, you know, and that's growing at an annual percentage rate of 8% or whatever, where do you think that's being invested? It's being invested in companies. Which companies? And according to what criteria are they being selected? Is it short-term returns for the shareholder? Is it a multi-stakeholder approach? You know, Cosinity Advisors is a company that has that offers portfolios. There's lots of portfolios that you can do for companies that take a multi-stakeholder approach. Who's calling up their bank and saying, where are you investing my money? Where am I investing it? Because the things that we're complaining about, we're probably funding and we don't even know it. We are the employees, we are the investors, we are the consumers, we are the boss. We are the people. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, I, I'm enjoying this conversation. I could probably talk to you for another 10 hours or something about it. Um, give us a, you know, what's your philosophy on the entire nonprofit sector and how, because people think that nonprofit means you're not making any money. <laughs> so can you kind of just, for those people who might be interested in starting a nonprofit and, um, and making a difference in the world that way, can you explain to them what a nonprofit really is and how it can benefit them as well as the cause that they're wanting to do? Yeah, well, I'm not a lawyer, but I have ran nonprofits and I work for a nonprofit. And the difference between a nonprofit and a for-profit is there's a lot more accountability and you have more of a fiduciary responsibility to achieve your and advance your charitable purpose, right? So there's a purpose beyond profits. There's nothing preventing a company from having a purpose beyond profits. Instead of the C Corp, there's the B Corp, you know, that you can get. And there's all kinds of community giving programs and principled entrepreneurs out there doing it. But a nonprofit, um, usually people start that because they are able to take donations that they can offer the donors to make tax deductions on. And so the IRS tax deductible status is what is a big, a big draw to that. But you can pay yourself as an employee just the same. And you can pay yourself you know, a, a really reasonable salary depending on the size of your nonprofit and the uh, uh, flow of donations that you have coming in. I'm not really qualified to talk more about the legal right. aspect of it or the structure part, but I do think if you want to go out there and make a difference, you don't need anything to get started. You don't need anything to take donations. You don't need tax deductible status and you don't need to set up a, uh, a, a nonprofit. You simply look out the window at the world that you see laying in ruins and past the point of no return. And instead of seeing that, you say, what an opportunity to make a difference. How could I come to the table? You know, I sat in this think tank, this utopian think tank of dreamers and visionaries who went around and described the perfect world they all wish they had. And it was, you know, more war, no more violence, no more poverty, no more starvation, no more decimation of the environment, on and on and on and on. And then it got silly. It's like, oh, well, nobody has to die. We won't get sick. You know, we don't have to sleep. You know, we're, we're, we can fly. By the time it got to me, I'm like, this is no world I want to be a part of. What a boring and lonely world. What would I have to bring to the table in a world where nobody needs anybody anymore? We need to look out the window and say, thank God the world's not perfect already. 
You know, this is an opportunity for meaning and purpose. We go and turn on Netflix or go into a dark hypnotic theater and dream through watching our favorite actors and actresses about having a purpose and calling. We watch them overcome all in, in the face of all adversity and wrongful accusation, do what only they can do, right? While in our own lives, the greatest opportunity for meaning and purpose and calling exists right here, right now, within the fabric of this moment. And we know it not. Awesome. On that note, give, a, give the audience like three or four actionable tips on what they can do to create a new tomorrow today for themselves. Talk to people you disagree with. Depolarize a conversation. Look for people, winning people over winning arguments. Think of the one thing that you would like to see change in this world more than anything else. And then outline the best plan that you can think of to actually walk out the door and make it happen from the bottom up. You can think, how can I, how can I create a product or a service that will advance this thing that I care about? You can think, how can I create more awareness around this thing that I care about in a way that will advance it? You can think, how could creating more healthy and, and strong communities advance this cause that I care about? Or how could I reform or supplement or innovate within the existing institutions of business, community, education, or government that could remove barriers to people who are facing this issue that I care about? You can go to uh, americansforprosperityfoundation.org and you can find other nonprofits that uh, can help you get connected to causes um, and, and join others in, in making a difference beyond just what you can do as an individual. But the biggest thing you can do is dispel the myth that personal action doesn't matter. We have this change the worldism, which is a psychosis that says nothing matters unless we're fixing global hunger or you know world something another. And I'm not gonna do anything unless it's, it's at a global macroeconomic scale while nobody does anything. If everyone would do the thing, the, the one thing that if everybody else were to do that would lead to the whole world changing, you know what, the whole world changes. Your personal action is the only thing that counts. And that'll inspire other people to do things. And it may not be joining you and doing what you're doing, but it may be the equivalent of that. And if everybody's doing the things that they wish everybody else would do, you get a whole lot of things getting done. That's awesome. How can people get a hold of you if they want to learn more and work with you? They can check out Americans for Prosperity Foundation.org. You can look up our, our podcast, Be the Solution, on Americans for Prosperity Foundation YouTube and social media channels and pages. You can also check out our larger philanthropic community, standtogether.org. Awesome. Thank you so much. This has been a, an amazing conversation. I know the audience has gotten a lot out of it. Hopefully, they were taking some notes. Remember to like, subscribe, rate, review, and comment because we like to have your comments. We like to be able to start conversations with you and uh, come up with more solutions for you. So anyway, thank you very much. This has been another episode of Create a New Tomorrow. I am your host, Ari Gronich, and we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to this podcast. I appreciate all you do to create a new tomorrow for yourself and those around you. If you'd like to take this information further and are interested in joining a community of like-minded people who are all passionate about activating their vision for a better world, go to the website createanewtomorrow.com and find out how you can be part of making a bigger difference. I have a gift for you just for checking it out and look forward to seeing you take the leap and joining our private paid mastermind community. Until then, see you on the next episode.